let's get into our discussion of prostate cancer. There will be approximately 220,000 new cases of cancer of prostate diagnosed in this coming year. So it's a significant problem. It's the most common cancer diagnosed in men, with the exception of skin cancer. Prostate screening. Um, we have a segment on our website that deals entirely with prostate screening. I want to not skip over it, but treat it lightly. Radical prostatectomy and radiation therapy um, are the big hitters in treatment for prostate cancer today and yesterday. Tomorrow, that may change some. The PSA's biggest impact is when we have a younger population of patients, when you have a long period of time to live. The PSA probably has more impact. If you diagnose prostate cancer at the right moment in time, you can stop it in its tracks. PSA screening and early diagnosis uh, lessens the probability of the presence of metastatic disease. If you have a cancer that's confined, you're, as an individual, those who assist you in its treatment are in control. As you can see from the slide, the mortality rate in our country has diminished significantly because of PSA. Let's leave this segment by simply saying PSA saves lives. There's no question about it. PCA3, which is a urine test, uh, which measures messenger RNA in the cells that are found in the urine after a prostatic massage, clearly correlates with the diagnosis of prostate cancer. Let's dispel the myth that the prostate is hard to find. It's uh, easily located at fingertip. Not only that, there was a lesion, and using an ultrasound probe, we can see that on a monitor, and we can take a skinny needle and put it into that area and make a diagnosis. Traditional therapy for cancer of prostate is radical prostatectomy. That is probably the gold standard. But I think that gold standard is changing. If we move into this area and take out the prostate, we have to be ready to say, and the risks are urinary control and erectile function. These nerves, arteries, and veins, as you can see, can't help but to some degree be disrupted. The prostate clearly removed, and if our assumption is correct that we diagnosed this early and the disease is contained in the prostate, then we've eliminated the problem. It's kind of all or none. This is <coughs> The area where the prostate was connected to the urethra, this is the bladder neck, this is where the prostate was, and a lot of things have been removed. So you can think that through, but you saw those delicate connections, and it can't help but be understood that something will be different afterwards than was the case before. There are some issues that we have to deal with afterwards. What are they? Well, sexual dysfunction is certainly one that's re referenced frequently, and many people have had successful treatments for prostate cancer. Now, I have a different problem, which is urinary incontinence. So, what do we do, and how do we treat urinary incontinence? This uh, is the artificial urinary sphincter. This is the cuff that goes around the urethra. The sphincter mechanism closes the urethra by squeezing on it. So does this cuff. So it can be placed in a way that it can either augment or take over the entire function of causing the urethra to collapse. This is a pump that is placed in the scrotum. Everything's implanted. And this is a reservoir. When this pump is activated, fluid is shifted from the cuff to the reservoir. Marvelous device. And I've been involved in implanting many hundreds of these 62% in this study was done at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, these devices are placed and have good service and last 
the longest time that I've experienced this thing in place, about 23 years. If the urethra underneath that squeeze pressure gets a little thinner because of the pressure, then the cough doesn't cause the urethra to collapse quite the appropriate way. We may have to downsize the cough. So it isn't perfect, but we can adjust all that. The point is, it gives us the ability to treat a patient who has leaking and has a bad smell and has isolated himself from society and is miserable and can come back to being a major contributing part of this community. This is the sweetest. This is the best. When we do a sphincter, people with solid faces come out with big smiles. That if we create, create space here by removing the prostate, the bladder has the opportunity to be displaced. If our bladder falls so it's out of the pelvis and into an open space, in the men's case, it's in that void that's created by removal of the prostate. If you cough and you exert pressure on the top and you don't exert equal and opposite pressure on the bottom, what happens? What do you have? You have a squirt gun, don't you? That's another contributing factor to incontinence. The male sling. It's called the advanced sling, but it works in post prostatectomy incontinence and by the very same mechanism that the sling worked for women. With a set of needles and a very small incision below, we can place a sling underneath the urethra in such a way that we pull everything back up where it belongs, and you, you've taken away the squirt gun effect. I've had patients call me at home and say, hey, I'm dry. What'd you do? The bladder. Here's the sling, and it's essentially holding the bladder where it belongs. The male sling works very much the way it works for a woman. Translated, it works well. I would say erection problems are really more common in men than urinary incontinence from uh, prostate cancer surgery. Penile implants. Eventually, we come to the end of the road in the context that we can make the system work the way Mother Nature intended. The patients who do have implants, they're extremely satisfied. This is the inflatable penile prosthesis. It feels natural to the partner. Uh, it's dependable, it's easy to use. And the sphincter, the sling, and the penile prosthesis are all, all ambulatory surgical procedures. The problems that you have are significantly minimized or improved. Minimally invasive simply means you're doing the things that you need to do, but you're not disturbing the tissues very much. There's a concept evolving and maturing called active surveillance. If a patient has a low grade, low volume prostate cancer, there's a good chance they can live a long time without doing anything. And if you watch the group of patients that has that diagnosis, and you watch them carefully, if they move out of that relatively dormant phase of prostate cancer, you have a clear opportunity to treat them. We actively watch these folks with PSA determinations, prostate Biopsies are done periodically, but you're going to hear more and more about active surveillance. Minimally invasive focal therapy. What does that mean? If we diagnose a cancer in the prostate, uh, we want to know some things about it. How much cancer is there? How aggressive a tumor is present? Well, the Gleason rating system simply means that cells that look very much like normal prostate tend to be like normal prostate, and cells that look uh, really different tend to be much more aggressive. There's a staging system called the TNM system. If the volume is low and the Gleason grade is low, you have a low-risk cancer. We can use minimally invasive treatment to take care of active surveillance patients that progress, active surveillance patients who've made the decision to no longer abide by it, or they want something else done. It can replace for the right set of patients with the right characteristics, radical prostatectomy and the radiation. These are small lesions. This is a larger lesion. We call this the index cancer. The index cancer has higher grade cells. These cells have the capacity to break out of their site of origin, the prostate, get into the bloodstream and cause 
metastatic deposits of cancer elsewhere in the body. This is a system where we have an ultrasound probe in the rectum. This is a grid, corresponds to a grid on an uh, ultrasound machine. We take a number of biopsies from the prostate, and we know where they came from, and we know their length, we know their size, and we can say, this is insignificant prostate cancer. This is the cancer that meets the index tumor characteristic. This is MRI, the key to diagnosing low volume, low grade, localized disease in the prostate is in large related to being able to find it. I think MRI is the key. Put the biopsy needles and the treatments that we want where we want them. We're tuning in early and we're going to put the fire out before, while it's an ember, before it becomes a blaze. That's what focal therapy is really all about. Well, I've been an advocate of cryoablation for a long time. Today, we use what we call hemiablation. We find the problem, we interrogate the, the whole prostate, we find that a significant portion of the prostate shows no evidence of disease. And yes, we think we can see the lesions, but we say, hey, look, let's be conservative. We'll treat this whole sector of the prostate PSA is a good monitor for the presence and the uh, condition of prostate cancer. The PSA is low, it's a good thing. If you take that as reality, what we see with this treatment of focal therapy, that we have about an 80% five-year survival rate, and those are very good statistics. I put them up against any other treatment for prostate cancer. High food. New kid on the block means high intensity focus ultrasound. We can take a probe like this, which is really a high food probe. We put it in the rectum. All we're doing is we're focusing the energy of ultrasound on the prostate cancer. Here's an area that showed up. It was treated with high food. This patient is currently in the follow up process. This is not yet approved for application in the United States.